Hello everyone, we'll start lesson soon. Sorry for a delay. I say in advance, no Kahoot today. I was very busy. Okay. Um, let's wait a few more minutes till we start. Today is going to be a big lesson. Um, a big lesson because not that because it's hard, but uh, because it's going to be very useful. And what you'll learn today, you'll be using for the rest of your life in C Sharp for as long as you do it. And in every project, no matter how big or small it is, you'll be using this thing. So it's very important to know, very useful, a big boost. And just a great thing overall. Let's close a few things. All right. I recommend raising the volume. Uh, if my sound is not high enough, my sound should be fine, I think overall as I added filters so I would recommend just raising volume I think what what about others do you hear me well Slowly start. Okay, uh, I'll raise a bit. Is it better now? It should be. I raised it roughly fifty percent. Okay. Um. I, you know, I, my biggest concern is not to pick up the microphone sound, the noise that it makes, and therefore I just reduced the volume a bit. I might have overdid it, but I, I hope we will find a nice middle ground. Anyways, let's get to it. So the purpose of this lesson is to actually cover how do we work with collections in C Sharp. What's the way of curing them? What's the way of filtering them? What's the way of getting count or, or adding different checks and so on? Um, so we will learn about methods such as where, any, order, uh, first or default. We'll talk about how enumerable works under the hood what is lazy loading and how, what does it do with anything? Um, we'll talk about some count max min methods. And lastly, we'll cover set methods, uh, such as union, intersection and subtraction. So extension methods. Imagine we have an array of numbers, one, two, three, 18 and five. And we wanted to know uh, all numbers that are under four, less than four. So what we would, would do, we would quickly make a for each loop, create a list, have our results stored and run it. Here you go, it's done. Well, there is a better way to do it in C sharp in a one line of code. So by saying numbers dot where, and putting a little lambda expression inside the where statement, I can filter the numbers and get only the numbers that are less than four. So what is happening here? Um, inside the where method, I put a, a predicate, remember predicate, predicate of T. So my predicate is predicate of int in this case. So I say that my predicate says 
that the number needs to be less than 4. And if it's less than 4, it evaluates to true. And if it evaluates to true, that's the kind of number that will be returned to the overall collection, results collection. So it runs through all the numbers. And as long as this evaluates as true for a number, it will be returned in the final result, in the final collection. So what is LinQ? LinQ is language integrated query. And um, this means that it's mostly used for curing purposes. And it's absolutely optimal for that reason. It doesn't mean that it works very fast, though in most cases it does. It just means that it's very convenient to use it. And in most cases, it is the uh, most efficient time-wise, your effort-wise way of curing something or filtering things. So it's a convenient way of doing that. So again, we just used one of LinQ methods, where. Where lets us filter a collection. So out of all elements, we get elements only less than four. Um, so you will notice that almost every LinQ um, method allows this Lambda expression as argument. Sometimes it's a predicate, sometimes it's a func, it depends. But anyways, it's, um, it's a consistent and clean way of filtering with where, for example. And it works for every type, it's, it's for generic and enumerable, so any collection can work with filtering using where and other link you method. Okay, and uh, I'll show you all the examples showed in the lesson. It will be in GitHub so you can have easy references later on. Let's move on. So what if we needed to see if collection has any elements at all or any elements based on condition. Well, again, there is method called any, which returns true or false, whether the collection has any elements or not. And it supports, again, a predicate. Uh, if we want to filter, if it contains any elements by that criteria. So here we say, does collection contain any even numbers with a for each loop? And with uh, link Q, it looks like this. So again, a nice one-liner. So I'll give you uh, 10 seconds again to have, just have a look at it and appreciate how little code link Q requires to create something, to make a function that does nice things for you. So LinQ lets us rapidly create functions like these, uh, queries, filters for collections. What if we needed to count the uh, amount, the count of all elements in a collection or all elements under four in this case? Again, we can use LinQ instead of for each loop. So for link U, it looks like this. Again, crazy less code. And all your homework, when you think about it, all those uh, loop uh, array operations that someone wrote, it's, it's, it's there. It's all there in link U. Order by, um, so, you can even order numbers, no more custom sorts. And actually you can sort anything, not just numbers, not just strings. You can sort objects as well. All you need to do is to pass it a, uh, a key selector. 
So here we have a simple bubble sort, classical bubble sort, nothing special there. Uh, just sorts the numbers that we pass in. However, there is a better way. What does this mean? It says that we order numbers by numbers, by themselves. Um, so it means that uh, when we compare, we'll compare numbers by numbers. So uh, and it will always be this kind of a lambda expression when it comes to primitives. If it's an int, bool, um, float, decimal or string, it'll always be like this because there's nothing we can do. There's nothing, no complexity there. However, if we take something like, um, like an object, so for an object, we can specify here by what, uh, by what property would we like to sort. So very flexible and very readable as well. All in Q is mostly the benefits of Link Q is that it's very human readable. It reads exactly as, as, as what it does, literally numbers ordered by themselves. Now we have some math functions as well, which are again, fully done using link u as well can be achieved so if we want to sum all numbers that we passed we can do that here is the for for each loop how it looks like with a for each loop again lots of code so we sum all even numbers and in link u it doesn't look this time that great uh, we basically say uh, when, when we pass sum, we need to give it a function which, which says, uh, a lambda expression, which says what, what does every uh, member, to what value does every number translate to? And here we say that if a number divides from two, if it's an even number, then we add that number to the sum. If it's not an even number, we don't add it. So we just return zero. This is, this is when we might actually consider this one instead, because I wouldn't really like reading this. And especially if you're a beginner. So there is a danger with link U that if it grows a bit complex, the whole benefit of readability might collapse and it might lose the point. So you need to be careful not to make Link U complex. Keep it simple. That's what it matters. And sometimes when we query stuff, we want any item out of the list. So we often use first or default, or sometimes we expect that we'll, there will be only one item. Sometimes we expect that there will be uh, either that item or no item at all. And um, the result of uh, every link queue is I enumerable. Well, for curing stuff. And since it's I enumerable, you need a way to get elements. You cannot index I enumerable and it is kind of ugly to turn it to a list to just get some element out of it. So there is a better way, more fluent way. And that way is called first or default or just first. So if we have an empty collection and if we say first or default, it returns a default value. So for integers, it returns zero. For reference types, it would return null. If we say uh, first or default for a collection that does have an item, it returns first item, just like the method says. And in this case, if we have an array of ints with a single number five, it returns that number five with first or default. Lastly, if collection is empty and we say first, it will throw because there is no first element and you'll get null. Uh, uh, 
index out of range exception. And uh, don't mind the, the tile, it's, uh, it should have been changed, but let's talk about sets now. Uh, Link queue is interesting for giving, allowing us to work with sets and do operations across sets. We can inter intersect sets, we can subtract sets, or create unions for them. And those three operations are called sets algebra. So a union of two sets, and consider a set just a collection of numbers. So if we need to make a union of two collections of numbers, it means that we take all numbers from collection A and all numbers from collection B. It doesn't have to be numbers, can be objects, doesn't matter, it's generic. So we take all members from collection A, all members from collection B, and join them under a single collection with all elements from A and all elements from B. The difference is that it will not contain duplicate elements. So if we have number two twice or number two repeated in both uh, set A and set B, it will be repeated a single time, not repeated at all, in fact. So the implementation of union with a for each loop is quite some work, to be honest. And it's quite some work because you need to see if we already have an element in union and if that element is, uh, is, uh, um, is not equal to what we already have in, in, in the result set and only then add it to the final set. So here you can see implementation with for each and here you can see how much more simple that looks like with a link queue. Literally four words instead of 20 lines of code. So, and it reads exactly what it does. We say that set one will be in union with set two. That's a good point. Uh, a set is a data structure which will not comp contain duplicates and it has slightly different methods than list. But we'll talk about such advanced or less common data structures uh, in, in, I think, later lesson of the same chapter. Intersection. Um, intersection, intersection is basically uh, what elements does uh, collection A and B have in common? So in, in the example, if we have elements one, two, in set A and one in set B, the result is that one is a common element in both A and B. So it's the intersection of A and B. And again, a for each loop, how do you do that? And for link Q, trivial as that. With intersect method. And it sounds like the algebra method. Um, and subtraction, last uh, for algebra, algebra for sets, is basically uh, all elements that belong to set A, but that don't belong to set B. So if we have elements like 1, 2, 3 in set A, and we have uh, element 1 in set B, then What's uh, the result? It's two and three, because those are the two numbers that don't belong in B. B has one, so we don't include it. And again, you see a for each implementation of this and in link you. At this time, it's not called subtraction. It's called accept. And can someone answer why is it not called subtraction? 
but except why did they choose to go away from consistency of set algebra terms? Could anyone answer? Here you see we had intersect, here we had union. And here we have Well, it's it's close to the truth. Like if you had word subtraction here, well first it would be a noun. And it doesn't uh, go by convention that methods are supposed to be verbs. And secondly, subtraction means slightly different altogether uh, in context of numbers in general. So you don't want it to be ambiguous with what subtraction is. It's not really subtraction. It's it, it reads better and it doesn't require you to know set algebra to understand what it does. And it's more clear to just have it as exclude. It's more self-explanatory that it's set one except set, set two. Like if, if you read it set one subtract set two, it, it would be slightly longer and you might start doubting if it does what it does. So it, it, it's less self-documenting, self, like less obvious. So the summary of this lesson is uh, to end it with uh, a reminder about extension methods and I enumerable. So all the link Q is done simply through extension methods on link Q, uh, uh, on I enumerable. So extension method means that it's a static method with this keyword for the thing that you target. So you target I enumerable T and you make extension methods for I enumerable T. And here is my go at implementing uh, a custom extension method for max. So here you can see I pass I enumerable items and a predicate so I can filter predicate of the same type as my uh, generic collection. And then I say, if I have no items, I return the vault T. And if, and if I do have items, then I try to find my max. My max is the first max. <clears throat> so the first element is my max. And then I see if there are any other max elements. And if I do find them, I set them to max. Uh, so if there is no predicate, I just straight away uh, set the bigger element to max. But there is a predicate. I also evaluate the predicate and only if the predicate is true, only then I set the max to that item that was bigger than the max. So that's my go at uh, max implementation. And lazy loading. Well, I enumerable does not evaluate until you need it. And um, this means that your exceptions will be thrown only when you call uh, to list, to array, or similar to your result set. So that's one thing to be very careful of when working with LinkQ. Um, however, if you do have this lazy loading, you can make even more performance optimizations like um, have multiple queries and combine them together and just give the final result and not those sub subsets that you will then merge and then combine and so on. So it, it is it is well thought data structure, well thought uh, language structure for making queries. 
however, I I'm saying this as, as if Link Q is faster in some way, and in reality, it's actually slower than a for loop. Because under the hood, Link Q is a for loop. So under the hood, it's it needs to be converted to a for loop. Uh, it's not a problem in most cases, however. It's not a problem because most cases we don't care about performance that much. Our key goal is to make code that is readable, that is good enough to be put in production. And if performance is something we trade for readability, then so be it. It's not a big deal. It's not a big difference anyways. And this lesson really um, puts a checkpoint to C Sharp as a language where now you have your hands free to do whatever you want. Because really, this is the last great feature of C Sharp that you will use very commonly on a daily basis, basically. So now you know the essence of C Sharp, I'd say. In the future lessons, you will learn more about it. But this is already enough to do a lot of powerful stuff. <clears throat> um, Joshman said that LinQ has a for each method, but it's not true, I think. It's not uh, for i enumerable, it's only for list. For each works only for list, so it's it's not very nice to me personally. And since you don't want to have complex queries, complex lambda expressions, and so on, you don't want to use that for each. And anyways, uh, next lesson will be uh, about LinQ as well, but about different side of LinQ about Curie syntax of LinQ and some more advanced LinQ queries, how you transform data from one model to another into anonymous models, and how do you group data, how do you select data out of different data. So it will be another cool lesson. Anyways, that's it for the theory part. Um, now, like usually, Please write one question, uh, one thing that you think you understood well in this lesson, what you liked, what you understood. Try to write it in detail, in detail, but don't be longer than one, one uh, sentence long. And also, please write down one thing that well you'd like to know better, that you think you, you, you're curious about, or you'd like to understand better. So. One thing that you think you know very well, and one thing that you'd like to understand better. And I'll give you two minutes, and I'll, I'll go grab a drink, because my throat is a bit sore now. So see you in two minutes.
Okay, I'm back. So everyone said they understood Link Q and that they liked it. Well, some people liked it more than others. And I'll say my opinion that when I was starting out, I also was a bit skeptical, skeptical about Link Q as it was difficult to understand at first. Maybe I could understand it, but I just still felt anxiety by having to use it, if that makes sense. But it really gets, uh, gets, uh, you will become familiar with Link Q with practice. You just need to now, instead of every for each loop, when it's simple, just make it, um, just use Link Q, just practice it, just try it. And definitely homework will be, an area will, you can try it. Uh, Mihail Fox said, Link Q loops made easy that can have lower performance than the actual loop, but it's faster to code and easier to understand if written properly. Yeah, about performance, even though if you write the same for loop translated to Link Q, it will be slower, that's true. However, if you do things like joints, like finds, um, something a bit more complex, you know, in that case, your for loop might actually be slower than Link Q because Link Q thought of all the all kinds of optimizations. So they actually made it uh, optimal for those operations. So it's not just plain for loop they thought about how to make it faster. However, if you know those ways how to make it faster, well, yours will be faster than Link Q. But if you don't, Link Q might still be faster than your poor <laughs> for loop. All right. Um, uh, too bad, cat girl. <laughs> Um, I, about live coding today, I don't think if it's worth showing anything because it's just those code examples that I have showed a bunch. So there's nothing more that I, than, than that I would show in live coding and you'll see all the code in GitHub. Um, and as Mikhail Fox said, Link Q is also similar to SQL. That is true, but not for today. For today, it's not similar to SQL. This part of Link Q, this side of Link Q that you sh sh saw today is just a bunch of extension methods. The Link Q that we'll see on Wednesday will be quite different. And it will be nice to see it. Uh, can you use a predicate in first or default? Yes, you can. And this thing we can demonstrate in live coding then. At least something. Soon. Uh, let's do a demo for first or default. Uh, so we have curing demo and we have our first or default demo, which I'll move to... Uh, to a static class and let's put it here first or default okay let's create a class for examples and let's have it here Uh, no filter demo and let's have it with filter demo. First or default with filter demo. Okay, so let's create a set of numbers like, um, whoops, 
like one five actually let's let's make it uh, words it's more fun with words right let's have some student names josh Mund, or mentor names uh kaisenel uh royal of uh me heil Uh, Hell Hunter, Cat Girl, I'll just call Aurora. So we have those names. And let's say words first or default. So let's pick the first name that starts with letter J. So, uh, uh, words um, starts with character J. So what is the expectation? The expectation is that it will print Josh Mond. So names, not words. So name starting with J is this and we print name starting with J and let's uh, run this and control F5 and here you go. Give me first name that starts with J and it came up with Josh Mund. Um, also one interesting thing that I didn't understand what was the problem and maybe Josh Mund can explain to me. Um, so for Max, I was expecting that I could put a predicate inside and it would find me maximum numbers, but only maximum numbers that are based on that predicate. However, look how counterintuitive this is. If I give it a predicate, uh, this is fine. Um, Uh, this is fine. Maybe I mixed myself then. But I remember it was... No, for Max it's fine. I'm, I'm saying it wrong. No, it's not fine. I deleted it. So Max... Yeah, Max that... Yeah, like this, right. So I was expecting that it would say, okay, uh, find me maximum numbers that basically are even numbers. And it doesn't work that way. And here, if we run this example, it says that this thing is a selector. So it basically will give me a maximum of numbers that divide that don't divide from two, but just the maximum will be two times smaller, which I don't understand the por the point of why did they design it like this, but let's run it and see if it works like I think it does. Not interesting, not interesting. Uh, yes. Yeah, you see, max link Q, and it's it, ex like absolutely not what we expected. Like I expected to f to have a max even number, 
and it returned one. And I cannot explain this behavior. Maybe Joshman can answer this question, but this is, this doesn't make sense to me. It, it basically, okay, it does make sense. It just, it just means that it selected the value, the maximum value out of those values, basically. So uh, three doesn't, it's not an even number. Five is not an even number. It's one, two is not, is an even number. So two divided from two is zero. So zero and here is one. So one is bigger than zero and therefore it returned one. But why is this useful? I don't understand. Why would I want this? Why is it more common situation? Because when I implemented my own custom on max, I put here not a key selector, but a predicate. Oh, I see. <clears throat> Kinda makes sense then. So this is not getting max even number. You need to do a select, but select is outside the scope of this lesson. But for clarity's sake, I'll just show how it should have been done. Uh, yes. Oh, uh, it needs to be bull. Uh, no, doesn't work. <laughs> it's quite, quite bothersome that it doesn't work actually. <laughs> It, it, it works the same as max. It, it, it is a key selector. It's a value selector. It's still a selector. Um, let's see the overloads of select. Oh yes, where is, is, is the way to go. And, and, uh, like this. Okay. A small brain fart, I would say. If we run again, we can see that all three are ATM. Okay. Well, it's okay. Readability wise, I guess. Definitely better than a loop. I guess it makes sense. I just really was a long time since I used Max and definitely not with a key selector. I think it's one of those features that might not be straightforward and intuitive, but I think it's a good example and was a good thing that we life coded and demonstrated it. All right. Um, um, that's all I wanted to show for the live coding part. Um, no Kahoot, like I said, today was very busy. Now let's talk about the project. Uh, so we have roughly two teams and I think those two teams will be working on different projects. I am not a hundred percent sure yet, uh, but the project that one team will be working on will be a charity project or a project for a nonprofit organization. So it's something that is a good deed if you do it. So it's nice to do such thing. And it's also a great experience because first of all, you'll be doing agile. 
you'll be working in a team. Second of all, you'll be working on a project from zero and you will have an actual customer, a client, um, and I'll help you or rather I'll stream, I'll try to stream the requirements gathering process and I'll act as a product owner, a person who understands the requirements and just, you know, has a check on you, how you're doing. Um, so a charity project with a real customer, real client, uh, what it could be for now, uh, I, well, for my company, I told this to my company and they promised to reach out to, uh, to food bank, to Lithuanian food bank. So you might be doing a charity project for food bank, an organization which donates food to those who needs it, who cannot afford it. So it's a really nice project, I think, if they let you do it. Uh, And yeah, you'll do it from zero and it would most likely be a website. So not a console application, no more, but something real, presentable, functional, real world exposure. Team size will be four or five people. And yeah, I hope it's it sounds good. And, um, if we don't get the chance, if they don't want us, if they don't trust us, which I wouldn't as well, if I was a client, but when you think about it, it's, um, it's free project for them. All they lose is time, not that much time compared to us, but they also understand charitable work. And it's an educational experience for you guys. So I think they would help being people with nice mentality. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. And, um, so if they decline, and if nobody wants you, then I'll step in and I'll reach out myself, some organizations, and there has to be someone who needs something and who has a bit more time than money and who is on the same page and is willing to, you know, give us a chance. So both teams ideally would work uh, on those things, different charity projects, ideally. However, I don't know how, how much team gaming is interested in charity. I'm pretty sure team culture is interested in charity as it's part of culture, but not sure if team gaming is interested in it. However, if we could do some visualization, I guess it could work out as well, but it would be a different project slightly. Um, so when will this start? When will this work start? The work will start in, uh, sometime in May. And this is no matter, no matter, no matter what worst case scenario, if if my company doesn't find anything, if I don't find anything, then it will work on, um, um, on our own project. Don't worry. It's not C sharp and website. It would be a different website for basically finding help. Like if you need help, if you need like, like charities could reach out to the, to the website and just post what, what help they need. And, uh, good people could reply to that and help those charitable organizations, even projects for free, not necessarily money.
maybe rather than yeah exactly rather than jobs board rather than donations board it would be jobs board helping via projects rather than via monetary gains and again key point on this project that you guys be working on on projects that you'll be working on is that it should start from absolute zero from scratch um, just curious, um, if I asked you to write down how much time could you sacrifice a day on average? Yes, you can uh, DM me. Uh, how much time would you be able to sacrifice on average for the project? How many hours on average? And yes, uh, the CV, it, it fits so, so well on CV. I think it fits at the same level as internship. So it's great. Yeah, I estimated this much. Okay, good. Great. And this, uh, this project, uh, this project will be at least six months in scope. So at least half a year, you will have to work on this project. So it's not a toy project. It's not a small project and you'll be working in a team. And, uh, at least, uh, at least uh, three more mentors other than me will be helping you constantly, uh, helping and monitoring you. And that is, uh, uh, oh God, I forgot the name. So embarrassing. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Where is it? Oh God. It's Matt, Erlington, and Joshman. Those are the three that will help for sure. Um, it's okay to be behind as long as you... It's, it's okay as, as long as you work and, and try to do something. Um, <laughs> Hellhunter is joking. Don't worry. Just, of course, just go have vacation. Doesn't matter. You'll come back and be able to work with it. Like in real work, people don't work not all people start working at the same time so it's again a different experience for others that will be onboarding you with the work they have done so it's not bad <laughs> and what else um what else um, I plan to potentially adjust a few chapters so that we slightly shift our focus to being able to actually do something in some, something presentable, not just the console application. So I'll, I'll try to shift chapters a bit so that you are familiar with different things. And uh, that being said, so far it's not clear, not sure, but it might be the case that uh, the project initial version will be uh, a desktop application because it's significantly easier to make a desktop application. But if uh, there is someone willing to take the lead, and do the job in the website, we're fine with that as well. <coughs> but it's not sure, it's 50% for now. 
I might actually just teach basics of web development as well in client uh, uh, applications chapter. Uh, and we'll be using Agile, as I mentioned, so we'll be having quite many meetings uh, quite many meetings, meaning that we'll have a, um, a retrospective meeting, a sprint review meeting, uh, a sprint planning meeting. So sprint review meeting will be for just reviewing how much work we did. Sprint retrospective meeting will be about you guys. How do you feel? What problems in team did we have? What should we do to solve them? Sprint planning would be just uh, trying to estimate the tasks, putting them in priority. And on top of that, uh, since we cannot have face-to-face -face communication every day, it's impossible. Uh, we will be having a channel where we report status daily. So once a day you write what you did yesterday, what are you planning to do today, and if you have any blockers. And that's about it, the full flow. After this chapter, which will still take roughly half a month, after this chapter, I plan to do two more lessons for one lesson for agile and one lesson for planning. How do you plan stuff? What steps do you need to do in order to get ready to do the project? Because in reality, you don't just start coding when you know what you need to do. You need to plan it first. So I'll be teaching you guys how to do that as well. So yeah, I, I hope this, this is a good thing and you like the idea. Um, also one more thing, um, when I reach out to the organizations, I explicitly say that there is a high risk that we won't do it, like that we will not be able to do it because people, I explicitly say that people will do it, who basically do their first project, who are still learning and stuff like that. So don't, uh, Presume that the client that you're doing this for will not understand your level and that will have high, high expectations from you because they will not. First and foremost, they should be on the same page that this is educational experience. And this is something low risk, high gain for them. It's a risk, but they don't lose much. Yet, if it pays off, they gain a lot. So, to me, it sounds worth it to take the gamble for them. And for us, it's worth it anyways. So, yeah, educational experience. Uh, and this project can easily land a job to you. And you can easily put it to your portfolio. It will be open source project. We'll do it on GitHub. We'll use GitHub projects to manage a project with dashboard and stuff. Also, me and Josh Mont uh, have made a repository recently for a conventions, team conventions. So both teams will have to or will sh should try to stick to those conventions. And those conventions are uh, language conventions, style conventions, structure conventions, and general tips, how to write code. So, you know, if you have any questions, like, should I put brackets for a one liner if, or should I use var or type explicitly, or should I have a separate folder for ex extensions, interfaces, exceptions, and so on? Well, you'll be able to just refer to that document and do it based on that. Or if you have questions, what should I write in my comments? 
what should I, how should I finalize my tasks? How should I drag them around the board, update my statuses and stuff? We'll explain that in the repository. So by May, it should be in place. Um, and yeah, uh, one more question. Would you like to meet, would you guys like to meet sometime on voice chat to have a talk to see how we to just get to know to each other? Would you like to have such meeting? On voice chat, I mean on Discord voice chat. Um, I'll try to come up with some game to, you know, just get to know you game. Would be nice to play it. So a kind of team building, but also across teams, both teams can join. Shouldn't be differentiated yet because I still need to pick people from, from the nine volunteers who wrote their names in the document. And actually let me have a look if it's more than nine people now. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, I'll also post the document. If you haven't seen this document yet, so we have nine people still. If you haven't seen this document yet, I again will post in the chat. And, uh, and in the announcements once again. Okay, so yes. So a lot of stuff for you to be hyped about because it's really cool that you have this opportunity. Lots of uh, practice for you potentially. And of course we'll also need to get um, a lead for every team, someone who understands things the best and can manage the team somewhat, who could take the lead and who who would who whom could we conventionally trust in, in some way? We need that person as well. I don't know how that person will be elected. Two people for one team. For each team. Uh, okay, so you're in, Michal? All right. Um, so that's all I wanted to talk about in this lesson. If you have no more questions, that will be it for today. So any more questions? If not, see you next time on Wednesday. Bye bye. Favorite use of LinQ. My favorite use of LinQ is writing it in entity framework when querying uh, data from database. That's my favorite use of LinQ in query syntax as well. That being answered, I'll go and wish you all good night. See you uh, on Wednesday.